Hi everyone, I'm Matthias. This is a recording of our presentation at our event on IC2023. The topic will be UNS Unified Namespace and I will try to describe to you what it is and I will try to bring it from a more abstract level down to a more concrete level. So without further ado, let's dive into it. The agenda for today is that first we'll go into what is a UNS, then why is a UNS useful? And then lastly, we'll take a look at how we can actually build a UNS in Ignition. In order to talk about what is a UNS, we need to understand a bit about the problems that there is in what we have labeled the old way, which is basically the automation stack. In the automation stack, we have different layers. We starting from the bottom, we have the PLC and sensors. We have the HMI the SCADA level, the MES level, the ERP level, and lastly, the cloud level. And within each of these levels, signals or data can only move one level up or one level down. So it needs to go through all the levels in order to progress up to the cloud, for example, and from the cloud down to the PLC, it needs to go through any of these levels down to the PLC. And that gives us some problems. Since we have, let's say we have a sensor down here, we want it to be available in the cloud or the ERP system, then we would need to get that value for the PLC here from the sensor, and then propagate that value from the PLC to HMI, and then from the HMI to the SCADA and so on. And each communication between each layer might be in a different protocol and requires new setup to be done in order for that to be done. So you have to put some engineers to get the values from PLC, HMI to SCADA maybe, and then some other engineers or specialists to get that information from the SCADA system to the MES system. And then again, somebody else to get that data from MES to ERP, and then lastly to the cloud. So it takes a lot of work to propagate these values, data points from the bottom to the top of the automation stack. And also if you go from the top to the bottom, it's the same issue, just reversed. That is not scalable since you would need to do this for each of the signals and it's expensive to do. You need a lot of man hours to do it. And if you add some new equipment to the factory floor, then you have the same problem again. You need to start over again. It's very not scalable. Then on top of that, it's also hard to maintain since you have all these explicit connections. And then if something is changing, then you need to know where to go in and change that. And in a big system, it can be very hard to figure out where is the change that needs to be done without interfering with anything else. So usually it's very hard to maintain as well. On top of that, we have a problem with data access. So let's say you have a lot of data on the PLCs and all that, but you're not actually able to get a lot of that up to the HMI or to the SCADA system or to any of the other layers. So you might have some information on the PLC level that you're not even using for anything. And the same could go with the SCADA or MES or ERP system that, that you have some data there that, that basically just piles up there. In the SCADA system, you might historize a lot of values that you never actually use for anything because, well, it's too hard to get out to the MES system, for example. And that's also why it's getting very difficult to use the data. You don't have these direct access to data, so you need to explicitly make connections to any of the data that you actually need. On top of that, that, that makes it very rigid to try out new things because you need to get data available first before you can actually do something. So that makes it difficult to innovate on new solutions and, and try out new things and compare data in a different way in order to actually get some knowledge and some information out of it. So that's some of the problems in the old way. Then <clears throat> naturally, if we have the old way, we will also have a, a new way or a better way. That's what we have labeled this concept of an IoT platform. So when we're going from the automation stack to this platform idea, the idea is to get all data that could be anything to everybody when and where they need it. So you have all these different devices connected to the platform and then the devices, it could be systems, applications and so on. It could be basically anything, but they will um, publish data to the platform, but also subscribe data from the platform so they can use data. So basically if you have the warehouse management system, in that case, that could use data from the platform here that it is from the SCADA system or the PLCs, but also from, from the ERP system and then use that information to something and then publish back the information so that maybe the MES system can use some of that data as well. The idea is that everything runs through this platform, that anything is, is connected to the platforms and everything is available. And this is the concept of, of a unified namespace or for short, a UNS. 
So within this unified namespace, all data is following the same structure. So any application or system that is connected to the UNS can find the data in a in this hierarchy that is, is placed within the UNS. And in that way, all data is also available to any of these devices and services that might actually need that information. One of the things that is important in this case is that, for instance, for PLC data or factory floor data, production data, so on, that you want to contextualize that as close as, as close to the source as possible. And the reason you want to do that is because once you put it in here, then any system can use it and then you want to know the context of it, the units, the engineering limits, where is it located and so on and so on. So all these things should already, already be contextualized on the data when it arrives in the platform here. So we want to do that as close to the data source as possible. So when we are talking about UNS, because this is pretty clear that this is the this solves all our problems that we had with the automation stack not scalable hard to maintain hard to get access to data and all that here we can actually easily plug in new devices new systems in and get data to the platform but also get data out of it and and we can easily um, maintain this as only you you need to look at the device or system to how that is set up and, and configure that and it's it's easier to maintain but that's also all good but how do we actually do this what is the tools we have that we can we can build a a platform like this so for that as a as a protocol for that and one of the most used protocols for the for this concept here is uh, mqtt so i'd like to just briefly go go through what what mqtt is MQTT is a lightweight uh, pops up messaging protocol. It's invented by Arlen Nipper and some other guys back in the 1990s. It was built to be very lightweight and use as little bandwidth as possible when sending messages and sending data out from these. They were working with some oil pipelines that were placed outside in the middle of nowhere and they were not connected. So basically they, they had to connect to these oil pipelines through satellite uplinks and then naturally that could be very expensive and not possible to, to be connected all the time so so they had to find a, a protocol that was actually lightweight and were able to to be used in these in these scenarios at the time there was mm, i believe no options so they invented their own and called that mqtt tt is a report by exception and what that means is that it reports new values when they change so in the diagram here on the right, we can see that we have an MQTT client as a publisher. It publishes a temperature value, and then we have an MQTT broker, and then we have some two MQTT clients as well that are subscribers. So the MQTT client that is a publisher, in this case is a temperature sensor, here it, it has a value of 24, so that is being published to the to the broker um, or the MQTT server, or it's, it's called a broker, but that's where everybody is communicating into and the broker would also be placed here in the in the platform here when that value is changing it's published to the broker and the broker if there is any subscribers it will tell these subscribers that hey a value has been changed so here's the new value so and then basically nothing happens until the value changes again so let's say it changes to 25 then the device again published that hey my value has now changed to 25 and then all the devices are getting that information but it's not like the the device here, the publisher is publishing 24, 24, 24, 24 every five seconds or so. It's only publishing that 24 once when it's changing. So that's the, the concept of report by exception. But then MQTT is secure using TLS. There's a, obviously a lot more to MQTT, but this is just the main point here. And then we have the, the MQTT Sparkplug B specification. You might have heard about that one or at least heard it mentioned. So the Sparkplug B specification is just a specification. It specifies how you should use the MQTT protocol, for instance. So the specification includes the topic namespace definition, the payload definition, and the session state definition, amongst other things. But what's interesting here is the, the topic namespace definition where you, where, where you have the namespace that would be Sparkplug B version 1.0, and then you have the group ID, and the group ID, HTML ID, and device ID is something that you select by yourself depending on what group it is what what is the edge node and if there's any device id or multiple device ids then the message types it varies depending on on where in the 
communication we are. So basically in the beginning, the message type will be a birth certificate once a new device is connecting to the broker. And then when it starts to send data, it's just the data. And then if it disconnects, it could be a, a death certificate or death message. So basically this is the message type of the topic that is being published. But the thing that we should worry about here is the group ID, it's node ID and device ID. The other things are taken care of by the Spark B specification. And if the, if the broker is Spark B compliant, then it will be able to, to, to use this topic namespace and, and create the namespaces in the, in the structure. So we'll see that in the, in the example later on. Then we have the payload definition. Uh, in MQTC Spark B, the, the payloads encoded using Google protobufs, but here on the right side, we can see a, a, a payload that is not encoded here in this case. So we can actually see what, what a payload consists of. So a payload consists of a timestamp of the payload. Then we have a, a list with metrics with a name of the, of the topic. Uh, we have an alias or name of the metric it is. And then we have an alias of the, for that metric. And that means that we can actually in subsequent messages, we can, instead of referring to it by name, we can actually just give it this number and then we'll, in the broker will know which topic we're actually writing to. And then we have the timestamp of when this value was recorded. Then we have the data type, the, in this case, it's string. We have historical values. If it's a historical value, in this case, it's false. And then we have the actual value. So the, the historical flag here is interesting because if, for instance, this publisher up here, it disconnects for some time and changes have been made within that time, then those values will be stored locally here. And then once the connection up and run again, the MQTT client will publish the, the stored values basically. And then since those are now historical values because they already haven't, not something that happened right now, then this flag will be set to true. So in that way, the broker knows that if this is a real time value or is it just a historical value. And then we have the session state definitions, which uses these uh, deep birth and, and in birth certificates to, and this last one testament of MQTT to, to actually monitor the, se the session states uh, and keeping the states of different MQTT clients and applications connected. Good. And then we have the, the infrastructure. Since we are Ignition only company, then naturally we will use Ignition Gateway as our platform. So this platform we have here in the middle, we will naturally put in Ignition here and use that for it. And the reason we want to do that is that we have all the tools for, for building the necessary structure there. All the, the protocols we're using here is uh, open source or non proprietary uh, protocols at least. Ignition is an open source platform. And then Ignition also have a large set of connectors. So we have Modbus TCP, we have OPC UA, we have um, MQTT, for instance, to, to connect to different devices. And, and there are some, some device drivers already in Ignition. Yeah, Ignition is, has a lot of, of ways to, to communicate with different devices. It's a good platform to put in this uh, as the platform. Then for the communication protocol, uh, the main protocol we will use here is uh, MQTT with the Spark B specification. In Ignition, we have mainly three modules we're using for MQTT. Here we're using the MQTT transmission module. The transmission module will be translating regular tags or tags in general into MQTT topics and publish those to, to any MQTT broker. Then we have the MQTT distributor module and the MQTT distributor mod module is actually the MQTT broker. So when we have the broker up here, so in order to get that into Ignition, we actually use the distributor module. You could also use other MQTC brokers like the HiveMQ or EMQX or so on. There are multiple different um, MQTC brokers, but in this case here, we're using the distributor module. Then in order to view any of the topics within the broker and actually look at the whole namespace or the whole tag structure within the broker, we're using the MQTC engine module. So this was a little bit about what tools we will be using. So then a natural next step would be to talk about the structure of the UNS. And this was actually an interesting thing because there is no standard on how to structure a UNS. This all comes down to what you have, what type of structure you already have and how you want to structure out all your things here. But a, a good starting point is the ISA 95 to get started, how to structure everything if you don't have anything else in, in the beginning. 
So the IC95 standard uh, gives you an enterprise, then a site, an area, a line, and then lastly a machine or, or a cell. So the structure would look like this. So you have the, in our case here, our enterprise would, is called IC. We have a location or a site called Granada. We have an area called bottle production area. Within that area, we have one line or line one, and then we have machine one here, and then different tags and, and folders within that machine. So that would be a natural way of, of structuring your UNS. And then within each of these folders, you could put information. So there could be some within the side of Granada, you could have more areas, but you could also have calculations on the OEE for that for that side, you could have some metadata about that side and so on and so on. So you could add different data into different levels in the hierarchy here. But as you can see here, there's a conflict between IC95 and MQT Spark B. So when you when you look at the IC95, for example, you have five levels, enterprise, site, area, line, and cell. And if you look at the MQT Spark B, then you actually have group ID, edge node ID, and device ID. In this case, we, we disregard the the namespace and the message type because they those are implicit in this case here so the only ones you can actually change is the group id edge node and device id and, and this poses a problem because let's say you wanted to publish something to your blogger that should go into the area for example do you then put an enterprise side area that's all all good but the problem is that the group id and it's not the, the combination of those should be unique. So if you have enterprise inside, and then area down here, then, then if you have area one and then area two, if you add another area two, then you already have that topic called enterprise side in the group ID and HNOD. So that, that will actually start a conflict there. So you need to have a way to, to map the IC95 over to the group HNOD and device ID. There are, Within the community, there's different methods of doing this. And, and two of the methods I would like to highlight here in this case is the is first the Paris method developed by Matthew Paris. So what he suggests is that you're using a topic like this here so that you actually put in your ISO 95 part here with the delimiters in between of the, of the levels. So in this case here, as the group ID, he puts in the enterprise side area line cell in this case here, and then the edge node device ID is just left blank. What will happen in this case here, when you publish this to the blogger, you will get this enterprise underscore site underscore area underscore line underscore cell as a folder in here. So within that folder, you'll get your edge nodes and whatever values there is in that topic. And then you would need to translate that so that you can map that out into this structure again. So that's the issue with this one, that you get all of these basically just flat uh, MQTT, um, within each of these these folders here. And, that, and that's that can potentially be a problem and requires a bit of workaround to end up with a, with a structure like this. Then the other method is the Schultz method. And this is a, done in a different way. Say you have this, this structure here and then you have a on, on site, you have on the machine, you put in a lo local UNS. So you put in a, a, a broker on the machine where you have the UNS for that machine. And then if you had like three machines, you would have three different UNSs for these machines. And on each of the machines, you would then publish that local UNS under the group ID of line one. And then you'll publish that into the line one here. So you, that you would have line one and then machine one, two and three under that. And then again, at line one, you publish then now to the area and then area to site and then site to enterprise. So you, you have these local UNSs on each layer, basically, that is taking all the UNSs from under that level. So basically line one would take any of the cells or machines in line one, the UNS is on those and put them together on line one. And then in, in bottle production area, then we'd have all the lines getting together there in, in, in that UNS and the same thing for the whole Granada. So it requires a lot more UNSs, local UNSs, but and tend to be a bit more complex, but you end up with a with a natural group that more resembles this part here than having it just in a single topic for each of these combinations you have here. So that's some, another method of doing it. And then one other thing to talk about is the location of UNS. We, we talked a little bit about that with the Schultz method here, since the, um, we talked about the UNSs, they can be in different levels here. 
in the local UNS is so, but the UNS can basically be anywhere and it is anywhere. So you have the global UNS, it is not required that you have multiple UNSs, but you can have multiple UNSs, but you will try to have on the enterprise level, you would have like all your local UNSs gathered into one global UNS. So you have a single source of truth, the one place to, to fetch all the information there. But you can have local UNSs on the different levels, on the different sites and so on, so that you, for example, if you have three sites, you have a UNS on each of the sites to have all the data for that specific site. And then that site is then being published up to the global UNS or the enterprise UNS. And that is happening for each of the sites. And that way you sort of have the all the data for that site in that local UNS, and then you publish that part instead. So in that way, you don't explicitly um, publish anything from a factory floor on, on one side to the global UNS. You sort of propagate that information through the local UNSs and then all the way to the global UNS. But you can, however, publish through MQTT directly from the factory floor, and then outbound port uh, on the firewall and then directly to the global UNS. You can do that. There's obviously some security hazards and or security considerations to be to be looked at, but, the, but it's, it's different ways. But but you can have your UNSs split out and, and live different places. The reason we talk about this contextualization as well at the edge is that once you start to have these UNSs split out, you want that information in that specific UNS to be the, the truth. You want to make sure that the whole contextualization of the signal happens as close to the origin of that signal as possible at the edge so that once you propagate this signal through the or it could be a data model it could be depending on the on the scenario but once you propagate that through the different UNSs and it end up in the enterprise UNS then you have all the information about where this signal was actually coming from and where it belongs or it could be a, a whole asset maybe it's your whole machine you have a a UDT or data model for that machine. And then you have propagated that all the way from factory floor on side one. You have it now on, on the global UNS and for everybody to use that data and use that information. The concept of, of having these local UNSs and spread out the UNSs is called broker federation. I'd like to talk a bit about what type of data we have in the UNS. In the UNS, we only have real-time data. We don't have any historical information directly in the UNS. And then we can have that because you could have if you have some queries that aggregate data from the database for like maybe the last day, what was the average over the day, then if you're querying that all the time, basically, then then that average could actually be just a signal and then you could publish that to the UNS so everybody could see, ah, oh, this is the average over the, the last day, basically, because that is then a real-time data. So you can create these historical data aggregations and publish those into, into the UNS as well. But you don't have a way to, to go into the UNS and then see like, well, how did everything look like last month, basically. The UNS only stores the real time data and like, what is the state of the, of the business right now? But the data can come from all the layers of the business. So that could be from the ERP system, the EMS system, warehouse management system, PLCs. So it can come from anything and, and everywhere in the business, but should be structured into the UNS in, a, in the same way as everything else, so that everything is structured nice and, and cleanly there. So when we're talking about historical data from the UNS, then that historical data is actually being stored by some historian that is connected to the UNS. So let's say you have on site one, you have your local UNS with all the real-time data, like what is the state of that site right now, then that site could be locking data from the UNS directly or from the tags on the factory floor or whatever, that's different ways of doing it. But you could lock that information into the database locally. But when you publish the whole local UNS to the global UNS, then on the global side, you'd also have to historize information from the global UNS if you wanted to have something stored for historical purposes there. Basically, any subscriber of data can historize the, the needed data they want. So in Ignition, we would use the Ignition Tag Historian module, but there are also other historians that can connect directly to UNS, for example, the Canary Historian from Canary Labs. And there's a connector for that directly in the, as a third-party module in Ignition as well. That's just two examples of a historian for the UNS. So now we've been through a bit of these tools and what they're doing and how we can build this UNS. So let's circle back to, the, to our current problems. We have this point-to-point -point connections. It was not scalable in the automation stack. It's hard to maintain. 
have difficult getting signals back and forward and it takes a lot of hours to do that. With the data access, we do not have data or access to data and data is ending up in these data silos within each of the layers. It's hard to create new ways and calculate new KPIs. And we often hear that our clients know what they want to do, but the problem is they don't have the data. So the problem is to gather that information in an easy way to have it already uh, on the screen. With the UNS, we actually are able to do that. Once we get all these connected with the QTT and we use Ignition for it to gather everything and structure that, then we will have the single source of truth in that platform. Anything that connects to that platform will be able to get real-time data for the whole organization. It simplifies the system integrations since you can now, if the application or system supports MQTT, MQTT Sparkler B, of course, then you can directly subscribe to the data within the platform and actually start using that data to whatever use case you have. And that naturally also brings down the cost of integration since if it's just a matter of setup and you're good to go, then it's a lot faster than explicitly adding all the data because the data is already there. And that also makes it very scalable. You can add, continue to add devices that are publishing data into the platform, but also subscribing to new data. So it's easy to scale and you can add more things to it in an easy way. Now we come to the third point of the presentation here, how we actually build a UNS in, in Ignition. And first of all, I would like to put in a disclaimer here that uh, this is obviously only a solution for building a UNS using Ignition and MQTC modules, it's not the solution. There's multiple ways of doing it. There's no standard way of doing it, but I would like to try to show you how we are doing it here. So how we're building a UNS is, is firstly done with figuring out the infrastructure, like how big is this whole IIoT architecture going to be? Is it multiple sites? Is it just a single site? How is everything connected and so on? So we try to map that out first and then we we could dive into the UNS structure. How should the structure of the UNS be? Once that is done, then we try to start as small as possible. So the first two steps is not something we have to do. It's something we will sketch out and have a talk about, but it's not something we necessarily implement. But then in the third point, we start as small as possible and, and we do it vertically. So we start all the way from the getting the data to present the data in an application, maybe push it to the cloud if that's the case, use case as well. And so on. But we do it for very small set of data so we know everything works but then once we have done that then it's easier to scale out and add more data to it and more plants and everything else we identify and add the data producers so that could be sensors plcs so on that we add to the to the uns and put into the right structure that defined in in step two then we add the data consumers so that would be the subscribers to data that could be the application itself it could be any third-party solutions that need access to the data, it all depends on, on what the use case is. And then we, we build the application, use the data depending on the actual use case. So what we did here was to build a infrastructure with six sites in total, where we have five factory sites and one HQ. Each of the sites has a local UNS, and then we have a global or enterprise UNS in HQ which contains everything else uh, from all the sites. We did this in a set of uh, Docker stacks. So each site is a Docker stack on its own. We have site one here in Skopje, North Macedonia, where we have a Ignition gateway connected to a PLC. We don't have a real PLC. We just have a, some node red flows that, that are simulating data. And we have a SFC on the Ignition gateway to simulate a PLC and, and the process. And then we use that to generate the data. Then we have the MQTC transmission module we have the MQTC distributor module as the broker, which serves as the local UNS on this side here. Then we have the MQTC engine to actually view the tags from the distributor and, and be able to use them. So the MQTC transmission module is then used to, because we have mapped out all the, the whole tag structure on this local side here in the tag provider um, of Ignition, or now just in this case, it was our default tag provider. But then we are transmitting that whole tag provider into the local UNS here. And the reason we're doing that was because it could be that you have multiple sites or systems on, on this side one. You could have some MES systems, you could have some other systems that wants to connect to this local UNS to get all the data for the whole site. So that's why we have the, the local UNS here to give that possibility here. But then the transmission module is also transmitting the, the whole tag structure to the MQG distributor on the enterprise side, on the HQ. So here we have the enterprise UNS and the MQTC transmission module is publishing to that. So in this broker here, we'll see that we have a folder called IC and then 
Skopje. And then all the tags from Skopje side one will be in there. And the same actually goes for all the other four sites. So site two, Novisat Serbia, Granada in Spain, Valencia in Spain, and then Helsingborg in Sweden. And this over here is the is an ignition edge, but it's publishing data similar as to how the others are doing it. Then we have a red line here indicating that the Site 2 is also subscribing to, to data from the enterprise units. So basically it could subscribe to, to data from Site 1 from up here so that Site 2 can have information from Site 1 and that it's being used for production. But these two sites are not connected in any way. They're just connected through the broker and the UNS. So here the Site 2 actually becomes an application that just subscribes to data from this Site 1. And then naturally we have the HQ here and that has the same modules. We don't have any data simulation up here since all the data in the HQ is coming from all the sites. So let's take a look at the live demo. So this is our implementation of the UNS. So here is just to show how we have utilized that data. We have two sites in Spain, on the one in Granada the one in Valencia, and as you can see, each of them has a current state and a running process. And currently the process in Valencia has been stopped and same with the one in Spain. These two are marked the same because they are able to see each other's data. And the same is happening with the Skopje and Ovisat. Then we have our Helsing Bar and then our HQ. And in HQ, we can see all of them that are stopped. All of this is happening in the HQ project and all that information is being sent from any of these uh, five uh, locate factory sites basically into the UNS, global UNS on this gateway or this location. And as you can see now, the bottling and bottle production is now running. So if you look over here, you can see the bottling process and let's see the bottling production is, is running. And then in here, we also have the possibility of starting and stopping the badges, but that's just to build something that could actually be shown here. But let's instead dive over to the designer, first of all, so we can have a look at what the UNS is, is actually looking in this location here. On the HQ, we have our global UNS. If we go into the MQTT engine, so we can view inside the MQTT distributor module, so that's the broker. If we expand the edge nodes and we expand the IC, then we can see these five different plants. So we have Granada, Helsingborg, Novosad, Skopje, and Valencia. And all of these five folders here are actually the the group ID, HNO ID passed from the from each of the sites. So here we have the, this, the gateway of site one. And if we look at the transmission module, then we can see we have two different transmitters set up. We have the one for the local side. So that's the one, if we remember the, the sketch we had though. So that's the local UNS. And then we have the, the UNS on HQ where we're transmitting everything up to. So when we look at the transmitters, we can see that the tag paths are the same. So it's the, all the same we're sending to or publishing to, to both UNSs, but one of them is the HQ and the other one is the, is the local UNS. And if we take a look inside the transmitter, we can see here that we are publishing all the UDTs as well. All the UDTs are being published. So if we go away here, we can actually see the UDTs are being published. In this case, we could have specified the UDTs and mapped the, those into the same kind of structure, or at least for where they are coming right now, it's it's just the same UDT definitions we have on all, this, all the sites. So there's no other hierarchy in this other than an AI is an AI, and DI is a DI and so on. But we could have mapped those over to different versions of the AI, maybe for different motors and stuff like that. But right now it's just in one layer. If we scroll down here, we can see that the, on the command settings, we have not chosen to block any incoming command writes, but it could be done so that it's not possible to write any values on the HQ side that will actually be published into into this transmitter here, as it is right now, it's actually possible to write from the HQ and down to the to site one, for example, in this case, but it's it's possible to um, block those incoming commands. And then also we are not doing, any, doing anything with the history over the transmission module, but this is, was, would also be here where you set that up to use the store and forward and all that and specify 
which history uh, store you would like to use, and that can be set up over here, where you create the different history uh, transmission history source, and then you can define the the capacities of, of the different things. So that can be set up here, but for this case, we're not using that. One of the questions we got was if it, if it's possible to or necessary to use all the modules, and if we go into this structure here. So basically, if you want the UNS on the local side, you need to have to use all the different modules here in order for that to work. But it depends a bit on if you're only interested in subscribing to, to the data or you also want to publish data. So if you want to publish data, then you need the transmission module. The MQTC engine module can, can view the data within the blowup. It also supports some functionality to publish on topics, but it's not converting that back into text that you can actually use. So that will be not as straightforward as using that for anything. You should have the MQTC transmission module. But if, for instance, you your site does not have to publish any data, but only wants to to subscribe to data from the global UNS, for example, then you could actually skip both the distributor and the transmission module, and then only use the engine module on this side here to subscribe to data from the enterprise UNS. That could be possible. Depending on the functionality you want, you can use different modules on the on, on the local side. One of the other questions we have is also like, if you have an existing SCADA system, that is, let's say you had an existing SCADA system on the site number six, for example, and that is being and that is running and it should now have access to, to, to the UNS on the enterprise side, then actually if it supports MQTT, you could publish and subscribe to the whole enterprise UNS and publish directly into that UNS for that specific site. So that could go into the to the whole enterprise UNS as well. And that could be if it's not running in Ignition, but in some other SCADA software, then that could, as long as it supports MQTG Spark B, then it could push, publish directly into that uh, enterprise UNS. And then basically it will go in here and then we'll actually be able to see it in, in here. So that would just have a different name here, depending on what your edge node ID is called here. And that was the, the UNS on how it looks on side one. So. On side one, we have the tag structure of the IC95 standard. We have the IC, Scorpio, Brewing area, area, line one, and then we have the different machines. And here we have the, the different UDTs defined over here. And then these are then used to simulate data. And for simulating the data, we're using the SFC sequential function chart. So we have a flow in there that will change all of these values here. And that's actually what we can see over here. So we have a uh, front in here for that. We can start the batch and then different values will change. And then if we go back here to side one, then we can actually see that, for example, level one should now be starting to increase. It does that, that's using the same sequential function chart. So we're using that. And actually, if we jump over to MQTT engine on the HQ, we go to, there was Scopia, brewing area, line one. Then we would actually be able to see here that that one is now being raised to 100. If we go back to the process here, we can see this is starting to run. So let's see if we can, we can find that one. That would be this one here. So we can see that one is running now. Speed status is 25 and now it went to zero again. So now it stopped and then the process has continued. So we can see that is that is going how it should be. That is the information of side one coming up to, to, to HQ as well. And we saw the transmitters over here. Every time something something is changed, it's being published up to the to the HQ and also to the local units. And as you saw here, I'm using the MQTT engine to watch the changes. I could also go into the to the default tag provider here. But here you would notice that now everything is is in folders here and it's in reference tags instead. And that's because we have in this case we have decided to map out everything that is in the broker into the default tag provider here, and we are using the reference text to do that in order to create the same structure. And then we are publishing that into the engine again, actually. Oh, no, no, we're not doing that in this case, but you could do that if, if you wanted. But the idea behind that would be that, that you could have some MES or ERP or other applications in the enterprise UNS, which you then connect to from Ignition here, and then you're publishing this whole structure back into the, to the UNS again. Unless you have 
you su- your 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 PMS or whatever application you're using there is supporting MQTC Spark B, it could go in into this directly as an edge node, and then depending on the group ID and edge node ID you're specifying, it will either go in under here or it will go in under its its own topic namespace here. But if you wanted to put that into the specific hierarchy in here, you would need to map that out as we've done here, and then push this whole structure in again into the UNS. So that is how we have decided to do it here. And as actually, as we can see, we talked about the Schultz method previously, and that's actually the one we're using here. So, but instead of having uh, local UNSs on each level, we basically just have a, a UNS on the, on side one. On side one here, we have a local UNS for that whole side. So when we're publishing that, we're publishing up to the HQ under that specific side. So we know which side belongs to where basically on the HQ. That's how we decided to do it in, in this case. And then one of the things that is pretty cool about MQTT Spark B. So let's say I, I wanted to add a, a new line for the, for the side one. Let's say I went in here and then I say, well, business is going good. We add a new line. So a line two, for instance, then as soon as we've done that, that's a new line, new text. There's, in this case, it's identical and all that, but you can then check here and see if it has been updated already. So it's there already. We have a new line. If we go back to the HQ, then we should be able to see, and we might need to, to re refresh that transmission. So what you do is that you refresh, you can see that there's a refresh required here. So we go in and we hit refresh. Once it starts to refresh, it will publish all the text once more. As soon as it goes false here, then we know it's it's done there. And then we can go back to the HQ and now we can actually see we have line two here with all the different devices. And since we are publishing the UTS as well, then we have it there. And this is could also be for like whole areas and all that. This is how you would you would um, add new devices, new lines, new areas, even whole new sites. You could add that by just adding that to the text structure on the side you have. For example, as we did here, we add a new line and then we added that line and then we go to the MQT transmission, hit the refresh, and then it will republish the whole structure there to, to HQ. So that's how you, you add new devices into it. Another thing I would like to show here is that for our side one here, let's see this one for the engine here, we decided not to block anything else as well. But as you can see here, uh, side one is both subscribing to the, to the local UNS, but it's also subscribing to the HQ UNS. But here we have a, a specific user used side one admin and that side one admin is actually defined on the HQ. So if we go in, yeah, that was not the right place here. We need to go into the namespaces here. We're using Spark.b. B on the filters of Spark.b. You can see here that we have specified that uh, the namespaces should be either Scopy or Novisat. So whenever this engine is uh, is connected to the HQ, it will only filter in or it will filter out any other group ID, edge node ID combinations that are not as these two here. So in this way, we can only see uh, namespaces from the group ID IC and the edge node ID Scopia or Novisat. So that means that if we go on side one here, then when you go into the engine here, we should be able to see both Novisat and Scopia. So that's the way we can actually do it so that we can we can show that we can see different different sides. That's the way we can show that we are we are using different local namespaces basically. So Scopia is publishing to HQ, Novisat is publishing to HQ, and they are both subscribing to one another as well. And they can see each other. And the similar goes on for the for the Granada and Valencia so that they can see each other. So this can be used if you have sites that are operating or needs to have information from other sites as well. So you can in that way specify which namespace these devices should be able or these sites should be able to to subscribe to within the HQ broker. In the beginning, we talked about the current problems. We have these point-to-point -point connections. It's not scalable because of all these extra explicit connections. It's hard to maintain because we need to have these highly specialized protocols and, and a lot of work needs to be done for each of the signals that goes 
through the automation stack. Then we have the issue with the, the access to data and the data silos and how we can actually use that data to do something useful. So all these different problems we have in, in the old way, as we described it. And then we have the benefits of the UNS. The single source of truth, we only have one place to actually access the data. And if we just briefly reference that to the UNS, UNS in ignition, you can see in HQ, we have all the text there, we have all the information there. So that would be the, where you go in and find the different text you actually need. So, so you have that single source of truth. Then we talked about it simplifies the system integration. So that is as long as systems are supporting Spark B, MQTT Spark B, then it's easy to publish data into the UNS and also uh, subscribing to any of the data within the UNS that is already there. It's easy to integrate into and, and that also reduced the cost of integrating into the UNS. It's, it does not take that long to set it up and get access to that data and, and start using it. It's scalable due to the fact that we don't have all these explicit connections now. Any application just needs to connect to the UNS and then it has access to all the data from all different devices and so on that are within the, the UNS. So a lot less connections and, and easier to scale up and have a lot of different devices within the UNS, different applications as well. Then lastly, we have why Ignition is a good platform for building these unified namespaces. It's an open platform uh, with open source technology. We have all the right tools to build our unified namespace. We have the tech browser, we have the MQTT modules from Sivuslink Solutions. We can we can build the different visualizations that we need for, for visualizing our unified namespace, but also utilizing the data from the unified namespace. We have a lot of different connectors to different devices and so on and so on. So, so there's a lot of things there that is very, that makes Ignition very well suited for being this platform in the middle. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you.